Chair, better known as Justitron, and I'm here to talk about functional principles. Now, I'm here, oddly enough, even though I'm a Java developer by trade. Oh I my know. god. I have some dirty little secrets. I know, I know. So I, I went to like 10 conferences last year, and at every conference, my observation was the Ruby people are the most awesome. <laughs> Therefore, I was like, I want to speak at a RubyCon. I'll submit here, and then I'll learn Ruby. So I totally learned Ruby in order to give this presentation. And I wanted to talk about functional principles for an even better reason. Because about two years ago, I did this project. It was an important project for an important client, or at least they, 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 they sold it like that. And a big chunk of it, the meat of the project took about four man months because it was doing some, some calculations and some hard stuff, and it was Java, and you know I worked really hard and I got it to work, but a year after that, after I started doing some functional programming in F Sharp and Scala, I looked back and I thought, ooh, that wouldn't take me four months anymore. That would take me about one month in Scala. Scala is the functional OO hybrid language on the JVM. And it's what I work in now. And if I had to do it in Java, I'd need about two months. So just knowing about functional programming and how it works would have cut that project in half. So that's what I'm going to try to explain to you guys today. This is not a how to do functional programming, although there's a little bit of that. This is mostly about the why. Why do functional programmers work like they do, and how do they think? Speaking of thinking, I think my mouse was working a minute ago. Ah. All right, well, Sherlock Holmes knows a lot about thinking. And there's a story about Sherlock Holmes. He and Watson are sitting in the living room, and Watson's reading a newspaper. And Watson goes, why, Holmes? My dear man, did you know that there are nine planets revolving around our sun? And Holmes is like, no, Watson, I did not know that. And now that you've told me, I'll be sure to forget it forthwith. See, Holmes doesn't care about planets because Holmes is very focused on what's happening on Earth. His objective is to solve mysteries on Earth. And that doesn't have anything to do with outer space. So he doesn't want anything about outer space cluttering up his brain while he's thinking about mysteries here on Earth. Functional programming is a lot about that. It's about all the things we don't have to think about so that we can think about what's right in front of us. And that becomes really important as our applications get larger and more feature rich and they don't fit all in one person's head anymore. You have to be able to put most of the application out of your head and zoom in on what's right in front of you in order to solve these problems effectively. So enough about thinking. Let's talk about joy. Yeah, so one of the things about Ruby is I've always heard that it's maximizing developer joy. And we've had a lot of talk about that at this conference, which is great. And I know something about joy. In fact, it's my middle name. <laughs> and one of the things about joy is that there's another language that I know a couple people will leave their job and move across the country if they could only get paid eight hours a day to write Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you know I've played around with Haskell a little bit and I'm pretty sure it is the opposite of Ruby. The funny thing about Haskell is that it imposes very strict rules on what you could do. You can't even print to standard out or have your statements execute in a particular order without jumping through hoops in Haskell. Where's the joy in that? But in fact, there is because Haskell says you won't worry about the planets in outer space because you can't. Those planets cannot influence you and you cannot influence them. So Haskell kind of imposes this discipline on the programmer. And Ruby definitely doesn't impose anything on us. It lets us play. But one thing I hear from people who've gone from .NET to Ruby is that Ruby developers have a lot of discipline compared to Java and .NET programmers. 
that, that we, programming Ruby, impose discipline on our code. And we do that through idiomatic practices and just avoiding the sticky bits. And, and we can choose to follow the same functional principles that Haskell imposes on its developers. We can do that of our own choice. Ruby development is consensual. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about six principles of functional programming. Don't look at these. I want it to be a surprise. Let's go back to the pickaxe. So uh, a month and a half ago or so, on my way to Sweden for a Scandinavian dev <coughs> Um, I, I borrowed a copy of the pickaxe. Because that's where everybody goes for the basics of Ruby, right? That's what I hear. So in the pickaxe, right there in chapter three, I found a great example. And what I'm going to do is take that example today, and I'm going to show you how I apply functional principles to this problem and the, the advantages that that gives us. So here's the issue. There's a... Uh, there's a CSV file, actually a bunch of CSV files, because there's some bookstore inventory going on, and each scanner outputs a CSV file of some information about the book, and the objective is to total up the prices. Okay, pretty simple. Here's the pickaxe solution. The file names are in RV, and we cram each of them into this one object, and then we get the total out of it later. There's an anti-pattern here, it's called God object because this one object does everything. So here's the CSV reader. And besides ugh, storing mutable state, that is a big no-no that you can't physically do in Haskell. And in my Scala programming, I try to avoid mutable state whenever possible. And I wanted to talk about how to make things immutable in Ruby. Uh, no, no, not in half an hour. <laughs> not in three hours, I don't think. But instead, I've chosen throughout my implementation here to avoid changing any variable once I've initialized it. That's an aside. But besides that, this class is reading in CSV files and parsing them with the built-in parser. It is converting them into a book and stock object, a class, and then it's doing the total. Way too many responsibilities for one class in such a pathetically small program. So the first thing I want to do is change this. Therefore, I need to put tests around it. Put it on life support. All right, well, I want to test the total function first. And I look at that and I'm like, crap. In order to test the freaking addition there, I have to create CSV files and, and send them in. And no, no, no. I, and then my Ruby friends say, what do you mean? You can just inject the state into the object. And I said, no, 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 no. OK. So the Ruby community has taught the Java community a crap load of stuff about unit testing and how useful it is. Here's something the Java community can give back. If you have to override methods, or inject private state, or in any way get around the simple stuff that you, the stuff that you would do in production code in order to test an object, your object's wrong. Your design is poor. I mean, that's what TDD is about to me. Therefore, this is bad. The kind of functions that I like are data in, data out. And this is the most important functional principle, I think. And the objective is, all of our functions should take something in and put something out and nothing else. They shouldn't depend on anything but their input. And if in the meantime, lights flash and things spin around, that's not data in, data out. If it poops something out to the database, <laughs> not data in, data out. We want to isolate this from outer space. Roy Osharoff, who wrote The Art of Unit Testing, says that there's three kinds of functions to test. Functions, methods, whatever. Methods in this case. You've got the ones that are data in, data out, and all you have to do is do assertions on your output. Those are the easiest. Uh, there's ones that change states. You have to go mucking around checking that. And then there's ones that affect the rest of the world, and then you're like mocking things and doing behavior testing. And, and so Roy is like, these ones at the top, they're by far the easiest. Just some simple assertions. Super easy to test. Unfortunately, they're in the minority. Well, I want to change that. I think about 80 to 85% of our program should be data in, data out. And all of the important business logic bits should be data in, data out. Keep it simple, keep it focused, keep it testable. And then get all the input you need to at the beginning, send it into the data in, data out stuff, 
and then at the end deal with the output. That's how I write my code now. So good functions don't access global state, they don't modify their input, please, that's just rude, and they don't change the rest of the world. So here, here's my implementation of the total, the prices function, and it's pretty simple if you know what map and reduce do, but I'm not going to tell you what they do. Google will. Here's some books, they come in. We transform them into their price, and then we squash all the prices down into a total. So books go in, total comes out. I think of it as a flow of data through my program. And this is super important. In fact, it was so important that I wrote a blog post about it, and the blog post was so popular that people translated it into, translated it into Chinese. And so I went to that page and I had Google translate it back, and this is what I learned. Problem easier. Because we know each step of the way of data. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so now that we know each step of the way of data, <laughs> let's look at the, the whole program. This is the, the rest of it. At the top we have some nice stabby lambdas. My code here is in Ruby 2.0, although I think study land does come in at 1.5 or 1.9. And I define those. So the row to book function has the one responsibility of translating a CSV line to a book. And the read lines function has the one responsibility of getting the lines out of the CSV file. And then we get this. We get a pipeline. File names come in in RV. They get expanded with flat map which maps one thing to multiple things, to zero or more. They get expanded into their lines, and then those get transformed into the books. We plug that right into the sum prices pipeline, and we get the output. Next, functions are data too. This is a little piece of, of the how. Because functional programming is so called because a lot of the strategies that functional programmers use to implement these principles involve passing code around like data, uh, first class functions, to, and, um, and returning functions from other functions. That's the other way. So does Ruby support functional programming? Well, my first impression was, oh yeah, I heard there's these things called blocks and they use them all the time. Twitter knows better. Ruby hate functional programming. Ruby wants smash. So it turns out that's a little true. I'll get to that in a minute. This is the kind of functional function I want to pass around. It's like, it's a black box. It's like a vending machine. You put in money, you get out sandwiches. And I wrote a blog post about this. You can look it up if you want, but I'm gonna give you the too long to read. You've got blocks, crocs, and lambdas. Lambdas are good, the other two are iffy. You can activate those with yield or dot call, use dot call. And inside any of these code bits, you can do some flow control, which has largely unpredictable results because it depends on the context, unless you're using lambda and dot call. But even then, you can do insane things. If you put a break inside a block and pass it in, and that code, under certain circumstances, that break will actually not affect the flow inside your block. No, it'll affect the flow of a loop that's completely outside of your block. And that's just wrong. It reminds me of that scene in Beetlejuice, okay? Where they don't believe that their house is haunted until they're at this dinner party. And all of a sudden, they're standing up and they're singing, Dale, music Dale. And like dancing around the table going, what is happening to me? That is your code on blocks with break of them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you'll remember from the movie, it did not end well. <laughs> Don't do this to yourself. Lambda and dot call. All right. So now that we have that out of the way, let's move on to the real world. And in a real bookstore inventory, there's two things about data these days. Most of it is crap, and there's a crap ton of it. So the thing is, uh, Dan North at Scandinavian Dev Punk said that our job is not to write software. Our job is to convert data into information, into interpreted data, into meaning in the user's mind. And software is an implementation detail of that. 
So if our goal is to turn this data into information, and we get some bad data, and we all know we get bad data, and fail, no, we're failing the user. What we want out of a file like this is the total of what we can total, and some information about the data that was rejected. That's information. So to produce that information, we have to realize that errors are data too. And now I'm going to pull a page out of Pascal. And one of the things that they do a lot in there is they use a, a generic either class. Now, I'm not going to try to do anything generic in Ruby and get complicated. So this is a very simple either class that always holds either an error message or a book. And I enforce that in the initialize. And what do we do with that? Well, we take our pipeline. And instead of mapping a row to a book, I'm now mapping a row to either so that I'm noticing errors and keeping information or keeping data about them. And then I take that pipeline and I do two things with it. So we take the all books, which I really should have had that all either's, but that's too long. And we select the ones that hold a book and we map it into a book. We select the ones that hold an error and we map it into an error. And now we have two outputs and we have information from data that isn't all pristinely perfect. Next problem. So we're trying to keep our errors or data, but there's different kinds of errors. Since our objective is to total the price, what's the big deal if we don't have an ISBN? So this is one kind of error. Here's another <coughs> one. The, the column headings are crappy, and this whole file is going to be useless to us. Here's another one. It doesn't have a price. This could be useful for counting books by ISBN, but it's not useful to us. So in order to handle that, we need to realize that nil is not data. And uh, Zach will agree with me on this one. So the problem with nil is it has 16 different meanings. It means false. It means crap, I screwed something up. It means not applicable in a hash. It could mean key not found, or it could mean the key contains nil. And when it can mean 16 different things, it means nothing. So nil is your enemy. And what I'm going to do with that is a little weird in this case. Um, I, I, since this is Ruby, and I darn well pleased, I added a value to hash that I totally think it should have. I mean, a, a method to hash that maps values, which transforms only the values and leaves the keys alone. So this time, I put my row into a hash. I use my stabby lambda to convert nil into a symbol. So Zach used some fancy object. And I'm just using a symbol because I think symbols are awesome. Symbols are information, and they will not eat your head off. So I'm just converting a key to nothing. This would be like, I have an ISBN column, but there's an empty field there, into a key to a symbol so that I can distinguish there is no ISBN column from there's just no ISBN in this row. And now, my book initialized method recognizes that a price might contain no value, and in that case, I need to retain that instead of converting it to a float. And what I get is a book with a hole in it. So I've got most of the information about the book, but not all of it, because it wasn't all there. And now, my pipeline looks pretty cool. I'm still going to split it into two, but I added this piece right here. And this is the reject no price piece. Because for my purposes, a book without a price is an error, but only for these purposes. And what that let me do was keep the book with no ISBN. And I've reduced the number of errors. I've got more information than I had before. Ooh, next problem. The other thing about data these days is there's a crap ton of it. This is certainly a problem at my work. It's very common for me to need to parse and do stuff with the file that I can't read into memory all at once. Because that file might be 100 gigs. And I only have 3 gigs of memory. So we're kind of spoiled in programming these days. I think we're reaching the end of being spoiled. But we're spoiled by reading in all of our data, lining it up in front of us, moving it around, and then making a decision. We have to work with data as it comes in. Now in this case, our objective is to calculate a total. A total is very small and does not grow 
in memory space with the amount of input coming in. But I'm pretty sure at this point that the pipeline that we have will read in all the files, parse all the lines, turn them into books, do all the checks, one step at a time. And that's not going to cut it for a real bookstore inventory with millions of books. Amazon could not use this program right now. So what do we do? Here's the pipeline as we have it. All the files go in and they all come out. What I want is for each of those steps to, well first what I want them to do is just print something out so that I can check what order they're happening in. So I, I was doing that and, and the first thing I did was like go into read lines and add a print statement. And then I went into row to either and I started to add a print statement. And I said, wait, 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 wait. I can do better. I know a better way to do this. And that better way is composition. So this is another technique that functional programmers use. And I want to distinguish it from OO composition, which is a HAZA relationship. This is not a HAZA. I'll show you in a minute. So what I really want is to stick a little high piece in my pipeline right before each bit. So I make higher order function, ooh, big word, a lambda that accepts a lambda and a message, prints the message, and then passes the data right on through to that lambda that it got in. And it returns that as a lambda. So lots of uh, static lambdas there. But what I can do then is functional composition. And so to me, my, if my function is a vending machine, and composition means I line it up after an ATM and see the ATM converts plastic into money and then my vending machine converts money into sandwiches and then my little brother converts sandwiches into energy. Profit! <laughs> <laughs> so that's functional composition, very different from the has uh, of OO. And here's another example. I love, I, everything I learned about functional composition I really learned back in my Unix days. Uh, cat, grep, cut, and sort are all data in, data out functions here. They all take text in on standard in and spit text out on standard out. And you can chain them with a beautiful pipe operator, which I wish we had in Scala. So that's functional composition right there. You already know how to do it, you just didn't know you did. And now I wrap printing around all of my little function lambda pieces here. And the effect is that in my pipeline, I've injected a bunch of printouts. Great. Here's what we get from that. Sure enough, we read in all the files, convert all the books, check all their prices, take the valid ones, extract them, and finally, it's time to sum. That's not going to fly with giant data. So what we want to do is be lazy. We don't need to read in that second file until we darn well please. What if our objective was just to like, Name five books with prices under $5. Then we may not need that second file at all. So laziness is a functional principle. In Haskell, everything is lazy and debugging is hell. But in Ruby, we can strategically choose to use laziness when it fits the problem. And the good news is, it's super easy. See those five characters at the top? Argv.lazy. Poof, done. I thought this was going to take a couple hours. It took five characters. Now we get this. Notice, the time to sum is at the top because nothing happened until we asked it for the information output. And then it read one file, it converted one book, it checked one price, and so on, one at a time until it got done. This scales with larger and larger input files. And the other thing, now, yeah, that's, that's the good part. So the, the bad part is that if I then say, okay, how many errors did I get? Now let's count the errors. Reading file, converting book, checking price. That stuff wasn't kept in memory. It starts all over reading the file again. So you have to be a little careful with this laziness and really think about it. When you have a lazy pipe, you can wind up doing a lot of excess processing if you're not careful. So I challenged myself, can we have both? Can we have files that go in one at a time into a pipeline that does take the valid ones up here, total their price, and also count them, take the invalid ones down here? Can I do this such that 
These pass through one at a time. All totals are calculated with the same data flow through and no mutable state. And yeah, so I did, but I only have half an hour, so I can't show you the code for that. But here it is, it's at my blog. I used a weird thing called iterate T's, which is very functional. There's one really important thing that I want to point out about this. The, the thing about this, this pipeline metaphor and these little pieces, which are functions, is for each of these, you don't have to worry about anything going on in outer space. Just what comes in and what goes out. And that means that as you add features to your application, as you start counting the books by title and various other criteria, various other analyses on this flow, you just add more of the same type of pieces. And that way, as your application grows in feature set, it grows in concept set much more slowly. That scales in our heads. And we don't have to worry about outer space. So we talked about data in, data out, and keeping our heads focused on what's right in front of us and not getting distracted by having to follow other paths in the code. Functions are data to with lambdas and dot call, please. The errors are data to and the laziness help, laziness help us to handle bigger and bigger data streams. That's very important. Nil is your enemy and composing your function for profit. That's it. Uh, I'm Jessica Tron. I took great joy in preparing this presentation and I hope you guys took joy in listening to it. The, uh, the code is up here on GitHub and um, per Zach's point about seeing the process, there's a series of tags in that repo that shows me changing the pickaxe example step by step applying one functional principle at a time. And finally, my blog is there. There's posts about the, the pipeline of Doom and also about uh, does about Ruby and blocks and proxy languages and shrimp on your face. Thanks.